Hello, welcome to the March 29th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. We'll get started here in just a moment. I'm gonna check my audio connections, make sure everything is coming through okay. Bear with me just for a second. All right, sounds like my monitoring is coming through fine. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and we'll get started. So uh, what I want to do is, first off is, uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist for uh, Steinberg Products. I'm based outside of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia, and I'll be the host for the clinic today. If you're in for the live stream today, if you're watching this live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're based out of. Um, today is the last live stream of the month, so we'll be doing kind of a shortened live stream for uh, we'll go for about two hours and then we'll switch over and as our customary uh, thing we do for the last live stream of the month is we do a Zoom social meetup. So we'll be starting in, in about two hours. So if you're watching this live, that would be like two hours from now, we'll migrate to the Zoom. I've posted the Zoom link in the chat field. So if you, and I'll try to post it periodically throughout the chat field as well. So it'd be, it's always wonderful to see people from all over the world and get to meet and talk to people and listen to other people speak besides myself. Um, so we'll be doing that in about two hours. So we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or you could just simply... Um, or you could just simply ask your questions in the chat field. We should have an index of all the topics covered in the chat uh, shortly, a few hours after the Zoom social ends. Um, so I'll go through and rewatch the live stream and go through and uh, do all the topics. And if you wanted to search for topics that may have been covered in previous live streams, uh, Jan from Stockholm, we'll give special thanks to Jan has created uh, cubaseindex.com and you could search for any topic that's been covered. It's like 17,000 plus questions. Um, so you could search there. Also, I want to give special thanks to Agent K and Jazz Dude who serve as moderators on the on the live streams. So, um, so and they just, they're not Steinberg employees. They just kind of do this out of the goodness of their hearts and to make it a better community. So we want to give special thanks to them. And uh, also a special thanks to Jazz Dude who does a lot of work with the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a wonderful service for uh, the Steinberg community. So if you want to see just all sorts of different tutorials, and stuff like that. It's a wonderful resource for that. Um, just a quick note, I will be going on vacation at the end of this week. So this will be the last live stream until April 12th. So we'll kind of kick it back up starting in April 12th. So, um, but just a quick note with that. So I'll try to put a placeholder on the YouTube channel as a reminder, but just so you know, there won't be live stream on Friday or on the uh, following weeks uh, or, or the first week in April. So let's go ahead and um, get started. So uh, I think I had one question that may have not transferred over when I popped out my chat. So let me see if I can remember it. Um, so I think it was a question that I saw. It was... Uh, and, and when asking questions, if we could uh, try to indicate which level of Cubase you're running, whether it's LE, Artist, AI, Pro, if it's version 10, 11, 12, uh, and which platform you're running, that would be helpful. So I think we had a question about uh, using the logical editor to take like an existing MIDI part and kind of reverse it, if we could do that in the logical editor. So let's say if I wanted to... If I had MIDI data in this particular part that was kind of going up like this and we wanted to kind of invert that, one of the things that we could do is go to the MIDI menu and under functions, we could do this from the logical editor, but you could also just come here 
and just choose to like reverse MIDI notes and stuff like that. So um, I think we, we can do some of this functionality. There's also a mirror and mirror could sometimes, you know, turn note off into note on messages. So if I wanted to come here, we could also choose to under MIDI to functions, and then we could just choose to mirror as well. So we could kind of do kind of an opposite kind of thing as well. So, but uh, I, when I popped my chat out, because it was probably asked before the live stream started, uh, if you have more questions with that, just let me know. Um, okay, so we have a question from Walter Blackledge from St. Louis. Uh, says, Greg just purchased uh, Dorco Elements, great product. Wondering if you think Dorco slash Cubase users would benefit from tighter integration between both products, much like spectral layers. So it's kind of in the plans, you know, I think as Dorco is a brand new program, when it was first out that we wanted to make sure that Dorco had all of the core functionality and we're starting to see some integration with Cubase, but I think it's going to be a theme for future versions as we go along. So we obviously know that many of our customers want that uh, and want to be able to kind of seamlessly go back and forth. So I know that there's lots of development planning uh, to make that happen, so. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Mark. Uh, says, I have heard that it's possible to use one mix console, just one track and place it in the left side of the inspector. Um, what to do, there would always be only the active. Uh, what to do that there would be always only the active track, thank you. So you could have kind of a mixer and just left of the inspector if you wanted to. So if we come over here, let's say I go to Mix Console 4, and if we go to our configuration here, let's say our different visibility options, we could say uh, show only selected channel. So as I would select a different channel, I don't think that this automatically um, updates currently to the active selected channel. Um, so if we go to, let's say Mix Console 4 here, that we would have to again come here and if we switch channels to say show only selected channels and then that would adjust. But if I selected a different channel here uh, that that doesn't get reflected in the particular mixer. So if I go to audio 08 and we go back to mix console four, um, where we have this set up that it will show. Um, so it looks like, we, let's take a look, see if we can do this. So I'm going to just kind of hide this particular mixer over here. And let's say as I select, so even though it's kind of selected here, it's not updating in the mix console. Um, so you could kind of have that, but I don't think it's gonna dynamically update, but a lot of people wouldn't necessarily find to have a single channel open because you know with the inspector as it is, we could say, okay, I wanted my uh, inserts. Let's say if I come here, I want it inserts and or let's say i want it sends and my channel fader to always be open um we could open up and now whatever channel that i have selected will automatically be selected and reflected inside of so we have you know audio channels or midi channels we could have all these different channels just selected right there. So we could have the fader and quickly access inserts and sends if you wanted to. So if you could let me know if there's a reason that you can't necessarily see everything or if you wanted to have, especially dealing with audio that, you know, as we would select different events here, if you wanted to have this on a screen, we could just, I'll just pop over here.
So let's say if I right click here, I think we could choose this to always be on top. So as we would select, you know, different channels here, we could have these uh, automatically update, uh, you know, the particular channels here. And if we wanted to just pick only, uh, only the fader here, we could do that as well. So we could just say, um, so you could kind of do it with the inspector or just the channel settings and you could filter that and place that wherever you want it to. But I just wanted to see if there's a particular reason you need it, just the, it done in a mixer because most people would tend to use just like the fader and inserts on the uh, inspector. Okay, so a question from Dallas LaRue. Uh, what is the difference between linear and nonlinear EQ when para and when parallel processing? Can a different EQ on a track create phasing issues? So a linear phase EQ is as you adjust the and boost frequencies in the EQ that it doesn't affect the phase of a position. So, you know, 99% of EQs, anytime that you adjust the EQ, It'll knock out the knock the track slightly out of phase. Um, now, if that is, you know, there's obviously various levels of in phase and out phase. It's not like zero or 180 degrees out of phase. There could be, you know, zero or one or two degrees out of phase. So most people uh, tend not to hear it when doing parallel processing, but if you're doing parallel processing with a lot of other effects and depending on your program, if those effects, um, you know, have a lot of latency and, you know, early programs sometimes wouldn't compensate for like effects that were in groups. And so every time you put a track into a group, it would be out of time. Um, you know, or anytime you put an effect on a group that would knock the particular track out of time. So being that everything is compensated for, uh, it's not so much of an issue today, but you know, as you adjust a linear phase EQ and we could see this in uh, a program, a plugin such as frequency. So if I wanted to just come over here and we go to the frequency EQ that we could come over and we could just uh, activate linear phase for each band as we come here. So it'll take more CPU cycles, uh, but as we make adjustments, it's not going to uh, have any phase you know, anomalies. So I, you know, I would say if you're doing parallel processing that you know, if the, the phase of the EQ, if it doesn't sound right, it's probably not gonna be the phase of the e you know, being presented by the EQ. Okay, so we have a question. Um, says, hello, Greg. Uh, greetings from North Carolina, USA. Is there a way to export stems by folder, meaning all guitars in a folder track, all keys in a folder track, et cetera? So the folder track is really just think of it as being a particular folder. It's kind of a box. It's not necessarily doing processing on a particular, you know, it's a container. So in a folder track, some people want everything to be, uh, you know, I put it into a folder and a folder is a container, but it doesn't have any routing of audio because the folder track can contain uh, MIDI tracks, instrument tracks, you know, arranger tracks, ruler tracks, transposition tracks, you know, so any number of different types of tracks can be in a folder. So the folder doesn't have any audio characteristics itself. But if we wanted to create, uh, you know, if we wanted to create a folder and a group simultaneously, we could do that very easily kind of using a macro. So I'm going to just get rid of this particular folder track. And there's a macro that comes with Cubase. So if I wanted to now select all of my tracks, and you, you could go to your macros and then we could just take uh and i have a lot more than most people but you say selected tracks to new folder and add group channel so now i'm going to name my group channel drums and as we've done that it's automatically created a folder track 
and a group track within that folder. Now that I have a group track, since the group is processing audio, when we go to our export audio mix down, at this point I could just export my drums and have that. So again, a folder track doesn't pass audio and can contain a multitude of different types of tracks that don't have any audio uh, in them whatsoever. So you could just do the, you know, uh, selected tracks to new folder and add group channel. Uh, and then that would automatically be assigned as you put them into a folder. And at that point, you could just do your processing and export the group channels that way. So folder channels don't pass any audio. It's just going to be for organization purposes. All right, so we see, uh, hello, congratulations to Hans Zimmer. He proved once again that Cubase can help you win Oscars. Yeah, so I was very happy to see Hans get recognized for his efforts. Uh, he's probably deserved of many more Oscars, but you know, it's also been for Hilder, for um, Ludwig Goransson, you know, a lot of different Cubase users tend to win Oscars. So it's a, it's a nice club to be in. Okay. All right, and we have um, Chris in Jersey in the UK. So we have Detlef checking in from Dusseldorf. All right, and Best Korean Jesus from San Diego. And we have John Costigan from Kenosha. All right, and we have Rick France from Oregon. All right, so we have a question. Uh, using the shortcut, how to select all events in one track. Um, so there is a, uh, if you wanted to come here, there's a couple ways of approaching it. One is you could assign a keyboard shortcut. I'm not sure if there is, uh, so let's say if I go to select all on tracks, uh, all on selected tracks, so you could do that, but if we have lots of events, you could assign a keyboard shortcut for that. But one thing that you could do is if you select the first event, hold down the shift key and double click, that will select all of the different events on that particular track. So if we have a number of events in this track and I just wanted to shift, double click on the first one, that will select all of the events after the very first event selected. So if I wanted to select after this point, you can do that, but if you select on the very first event on the track, just shift, double click, and then you could select that. All right, so we see uh, how to duplicate the event using a shortcut. So if you want it to use a shortcut for duplicating an event, there's a couple ways of doing it. One is just uh, control or command plus D, and you could duplicate like that. Um, if you wanted to do it in an even cooler way is if we have an event selected and we wanted to duplicate, um, when we go to the right edge of the event, we'll see that we have a little uh, cursor in the right edge center. And as we hover over, it will turn into a hand and then you could drag it over. Or if you wanted to have yet another way of doing the same thing, it's kind of more of an Easter egg previous version. But if you hold down the alt, or option and go to the lower right hand corner, then you could drag. But if you want it with keyboard shortcut, it's just uh, control or command uh, plus the letter D for duplicate. Okay, so we see uh, how to move the MIDI events with the arrow. All right, so I'll just kind of come over so if you wanted to nudge MIDI events, you could just come here. So let's say I'm gonna just enter in some MIDI notes here. Okay, so I'll just make this larger so we can all see it. Okay. So, uh, so nudging the nudge command, I'll just get rid of these notes here. So let's say 
Uh, if I want it to nudge, it's not necessarily using, uh, you know, to select notes, like to select the next note, I would just uh, hold down like the left and right arrow and that would select the next, the left arrow would select the previous note, right arrow would select the next note. If I wanted to move these events, uh, we could do it based upon your quantize value. So at this point, I'm gonna hold down, I think it's Alt, plus the left and right arrows, and then you can nudge the MIDI events based upon the quantize value. So Alt or Option plus left and right arrow, just like that. Okay, so we see uh, how to see the quantize grid line in the main window. All right, so let's say we have uh, our grid currently set to beat. So as we zoom in, we can see our grid change here. So, you know, if we're kind of zoomed out, you know, so if we're seeing like, you know, eight measures between here, we're not gonna see just kind of a solid line. So it could depend upon your zoom factor. So as we zoom in, so let's say we wanna look at one measure. So now we could see beat. Um, but if we want it to also just see the quantize the value. So let's say I wanna see this as eighth note triplets. Um, so now as we do this, we could see our divisions and our grid lines just based on eighth note triplets. So let's say now I wanted this to be half notes. We can see the grid resolution change here. So make sure that in your grid that you don't have it set to bar and beat and you have it set to use quantize and then you could so then whatever your quantized value is, you can just see that indicated right here on the grid. Okay, so I just see uh, when I export the XML file and import it in Sibelius notation bug problem. So if you could let me know what's going on, I know that we don't have any problems taking uh, XML, music XML files like into Dorico, but uh, just let me know, you know, when you say notation bug problem, uh, you know, let me know if you're doing it from the score editor itself. Um, because to do a, a, XM, a music XML export, you need to be in the score editor. So a lot of people miss that and just try to export. So let me know if you've done that. All right, and we see Jan from Stockholm, Sweden. All right, and we have Omar checking in from France, Randy Lee from, and Robbie Bowling from Texas. Okay, so Randy Lee asks, uh, I missed last time, can I import uh, tracks from two inch tape and then warp those tracks to solidify the timing of new drums? Yeah, certainly you could do that to any audio that's kind of been transferred over. Um, as soon as we want to, you know, do warping of drums, you know, we could just kind of take your uh, drum performance and if we wanted to have this, you know, automatically within uh, a particular folder, we could have that set up as well. So let's say if I just wanted to come here and we'll put these into a folder. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun to kind of take stuff from uh, old analog tape recordings and be able to fix them. So let's say if I just wanted to put these, sorry, I had to sneeze. Uh, if I want to put these into a folder, so we'll do this and now we could do group editing on a folder and then you could do phase coherent warping. So let's say we switch to our warp tool and let's say the drummer was a little early here. 
or there, you could now just kind of say, oh, this hit was early or late. We could just move that and maintain kind of the phase coherency between the warp edits. And then you can make your drums nice and solid. Let's see, uh, I see from Benny in Sweden, says I'm sitting here playing on the Grand 3, great sound. Yeah, the Grand is still one of my favorite piano libraries. And it was actually sampled in Sweden, so. All right, and we see Michael Pierce on the live stream from uh, outside of London. Thanks for joining us, being a part of the community today. And we have Stefan from Sweden. Mark Rabin saying, oh my God, you're going on vacation. We will all perish, yeah. I've, I've only had about four or five days of vacation in the last two or three years. So kind of looking forward to it. So it'll be our first big trip in a long time. So, all right. Um, so any news regarding the Cubase 12 update? So uh, I know that they're uh, actively working on some stuff and adding some new components such as the uh, Dolby Atmos. So, but I can't speak to a release date, but I know it's kind of, the developers are working hard on it. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, can you explain the control room, the inserts a bit better? Uh, there is the main inserts and the monitor inserts. Both of them seem to work the same. What's the difference? Okay, so when we go to our control room uh, and we see kind of our main inserts, uh, this would be on the full monitoring path all times. But let's say we needed to do a different EQ for the monitors. So when we go to the monitors, each monitor can have its own inserts. But if I switched monitors, we could have different plugins on, the, on each set of monitors that are independent. So if I needed to EQ, or let's say this is going out to a powered set of speakers and I want to put a limiter on there as a safety measure, but these other speakers are going through a system where I have a button, like a kill switch, uh, you know. So if we put inserts on the monitors as we switch between our different monitors, so I could say, okay, I want, you know, th this EQ on monitor A, but on monitor B for my JBLs, I don't want an EQ or I don't want anything. But if I wanted the inserts to be globally on, regardless of what monitor is selected, that's when we could put it into the main area. So when we put on monitors, if we have multiple monitors, like we could switch between four different monitoring scenarios, each set of monitors can have their own EQ, plus you could have plugins on the, on the output of each of those monitors as well, so. So if you put plugins on monitor A and you go to the main out, you go, oh, it's kind of the same, but it's when you ha need to have different plugins on monitor B or monitor C or monitor D that it will become more apparent. Okay, so we see uh, how to make, question, how to make your 808 make a slide note. So you could do this and kind of, you know, often this is kind of dependent upon the particular instrument, but we could do this in the sampler track. So let me see if I still have this project open. Let me just find my sampler track project. All right, just let me look in. I have this one saved in kind of a weird place.
me see if I can find this project quickly. Sorry about this. Let's see if I could fake it with this project here. Okay, so let's say um, uh, I don't think that project will work. Let me just. See if I can find this, but we could do it in the inside the uh, sampler track. So let me just see if I can find it. Just see if I could find it and So let me see, I think this might work. Sorry about that. Ah. Okay. Sorry, I have to find that particular project. But let's say if I come here Let me just exit out of Nuendo quickly. Just gonna check my Okay, so sorry it's taking me so long. All right, so say if I have a sample track here uh, and we wanted to and let me 
just adjust the octave. So once we have like a sample here, all you really have to do is to come over and then we could place this into uh, monophonic mode. And we have uh, a glide mode. So once we uh, come right over here, we can just say, okay, we want to just put this, um, all right, so let's say I'll just come directly here and we'll say, okay, we want to put this into glide. So, and then I could set kind of the speed. So you could do, so once you just drop any sample in, you wanna put it into monophonic mode and then you could just And you could do different glides like that. So sorry, it took me a while to find a project. And it's usually not the one I use, but so just do it in the sampler track. All right, so we see Gerald checking in from uh, slightly moist California. So. All right, and we have uh, Philip from Nigeria checking in. Thanks for being part of the community today. All right, so we see uh, how to select the uh, all MIDI notes, uh, CFG by selecting the MIDI keys on the left side. Okay, so let's say if we have um, like a MIDI project here and we have a lot of notes and we want to actually select like all of one particular note. So let's say if we will make this larger so everyone could see it a little easier. So I think if we just, let's say we hold down F and just hold down the control or command and you could just double click on the key on the left and that will select all the notes of that particular pitch. So, or you could just, um, I think if you shift, let's say, so yeah, just click on the key, double click on the key while holding down control or command. Okay, so we see Hete or Het to Lap uh, checking in from the Netherlands and he clicked the like button. So yeah, if you, Want to click the like button that enables us to continue to do these live streams. We'd appreciate that. All right, and we have Tom Tom checking in from London. We see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. All right, and Mark Rabin is also on, if I didn't mention him earlier, from Montana. We see Taylor Sapp. All right, uh, so a question from Taylor it says, uh, in the last Hangout, you showed how to select the root note of a chord in the logical editor. The method shows the lowest note of a chord. How can it be used to find the root uh, if a chord is inverted? Um, so if, if the chord is, if we do have chords, uh, that method that I showed will select the lowest note in the chord. So it's not, um, but you could also, let's go ahead and take a quick look just to make sure. So I will add a, quick chord track here. All right, looks like I have a chord track. So let me just drop this up.
Okay, so we come here, we're gonna drag these notes down to our retro log track. Okay, so now we'll look at these and let's go to our logical editor and we'll go to setup and we want to select type is equal to notes and the condition is the context variable is set to equals you know you could also choose highest pitch lowest pitch uh, but you know that's for the whole event globally but let's say uh, note position in chord. So I'm gonna set this to zero. And now when I hit apply, it's gonna take the lowest root note of the chord, even though that you know these two chords are in inversions. So. so it doesn't really care if it's inverted or not. It's just whatever the chord is, it will select the lowest note there, Taylor. Okay, so we have a question from Taylor Sapp. Um, can you show us how to use the scale assistant to create your own scales? Is this feature available in Cubase 11 Pro? So yes, it is. So all you need to do is once we're in the scale assistant, so if we have like the editor currently selective, selected, and we'll see the editor scale. So at this point we see like it's set to by default C major. So I would just scroll all the way down and say set up musical scale. Uh, and then you could click on add scale and then you could just make your own scale directly there. You can call it kind of whatever you want. And then when you go to select your scale, you can say I'm looking for a C Taylor score. And so once again, just go to scroll all the way down to set up musical scales. And now you could just come here, uh, add a scale, and then you could just add your particular uh, scale right there and you could customize it. So, a lot of interesting things you could do with custom scales. All right, so we see uh, just a question. Um, uh, how can I get a clean mix? Mine is always sounds fuzzy. Um, so, you know, there's going to be different things that could cause, you know, it's hard to know without, you know, by default, you should have a, a clean mix, you know, check your gain structure to make sure that as you're working that you don't have like your channels clipping or fading. Um, you know, try to bypass plugins. So, you know, I see a lot of people when they're mixing and they will, you know, I see kind of, you know, to me, it's a way I don't work where people will have, you know, like 10, 12 plugins on every single track. And sometimes the gain structure between plugins can cause clipping and, you know, people are pumping the gain up in this plugin and then, you know, compressing it in the next plugin and then pumping it up again. So it could be a combination of plugins. So try breaking it down to its minimal sources. Try to bypass all the plugins and see if you export if it sounds different, and then slowly add plugins in. Um, so sometimes, you know, I think people we have the ability of running so many plugins that people just kind of do it by default, and it's maybe they saw like a computer screenshot in someone's mix and they had 14 plugins on a lead vocal, and often kind of the fewer plugins that you have, the cleaner the processing could be if you try to get the source to sound really good. So I would check just to make sure that you're not uh, clipping, like, you know, the, if it's kind of, you know, make sure that you're not clipping the signal, the gain, uh, but, you know, try taking plugins away one at a time. And I think that you can get a less fuzzy sound. Okay, so we see uh, from Michael Pierce, uh, quick question, can you confirm that any plugin you put on any insert in a control room 
it's not bounced with the master channel. I'm fairly sure this is true. So the control room is just gonna be for monitoring and is not included during the bounce down process. So this way we could have plugins such as if you're doing like room correction, like something like a, I think Sonar works, you could run plugins here. And then when we do an export audio mix down, this is just for the monitoring path when it goes through the control room. So they're not included in the uh, exported mix down file. So you're correct, Michael. All right, so you see Michael Teams is already disp dispensing of the virtual ice cream. See, Mark Graven says, uh, can you get me an Oscar? So I don't have that ability probably, but we you have the same tools that, you know, so it's really, you have the same tools as many Oscar winners. So think of it like that. All right, and we have uh, Jason checking in from York, UK. So thanks for being a part of the community and being on the live stream today. All right, and we have Andy checking in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Haven't been to Ann Arbor in a long time. Thanks for joining us today. All right, uh, so we see, is there a way to click quickly clear the inserts for all tracks? Um, so let's see if we, I think if we have a number, I'll just do a new project here and I'll quickly add a number of inserts across our tracks. Okay, so I'm gonna activate quick link mode and let's add a number of inserts. Okay, so let's say if we want to do this, so um, so I'll just have kind of all these. Uh, so if we want it to, I think if we just go, um, so we could just clear all. So I'm so I just kind of clicked here in the preset management, and now that all these are selected. Um, I'm just going to, let's say if we click, so I'm gonna right click there and say clear and then, so we could reset. Um, so we could do it kind of on, uh, let's say a track by track basis, but let's see. So if I just wanted to, again, just kind of right, cl right click here. Um, or on the channel, we could just say, uh, here's, so in the mixer, we could just come here and let's say if we have all of the tracks selected, I'll try this again. So let me just hold down the shift key So it does one track at a time. Let's see if there's a way to maybe do it with the project logical editor. Let me just see if there's any factory presets that 
might have this. Let's see, my Cubase is gonna misbehave here. So it looks like we could do it on one track at a time. I'm just gonna restart my Cubase here. It'll probably come back, but it may take a minute or so. So bear with me just a second. So let's Okay, um so one way is to you could probably like save a track preset of a let's see if we go back into our project logical editor to see if there's any presets in the new batch Let's so see if we come over here. So if we wanted to bypass all the inserts, we could do that, but let's see if we could. Um, so it looks like we might have to do it one by one um, but let's say if I had, uh, I'll try another method. But maybe if you save a track preset and you could apply the track preset, uh, but you may, may not take you that much longer. So So let's say if I have, let's see if I'll try one more thing. Let's say if I have these linked with my inserts. So I'll link these channels quickly. So I'll link and let's go ahead and link the inserts. And now as I come, let's say if we clear, if that will do it for all. So it looks like So if you wanted to remove each one and they're linked with the inserts, you could do it that way. But it doesn't, I don't know the way I'll play around with it if you want to email me. Um, and I can see if there's a better way I could come up with afterwards, Myron. Sorry about that. All right, so we have Crocant from, um, from Los Angeles checking in. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see uh, Cubase 12 Pro PC. The status line always appears anyway after loading a song. This happens when selecting the closed checkbox gear at the top right. Um, all right, so let's say, if I come here and I have my status line turned off. Um, so let's say we'll save this 
as March 29th. All right, and I'm gonna close. And let's go ahead and open. We'll do new project. So the status line here is turned off. Uh, so that was that maintained. I, I could check it on my Windows version as well, but on the Mac, it seems to be working fine. It's usually things like that are consistent between the two. So make sure if it's not, if you're starting with a template, then maybe it's your template has that set. Um, so let me know of that. All right, so we're seeing uh, Mark Rabin saying the alt option plus the left right arrow and it is great in the MIDI editor. Thanks for that. So you're welcome. chat field just jumped so let me just navigate back thanks for all the great questions Okay, so we see uh, from Andy just asking, um, is there a way to assign a shortcut or remote control to be a dedicated bring forward to the control room? I know I can use Windows Zones next previous tab, but I'd like a dedicated control. Um, so, you know, if you want it to do this, you know, you could probably just assign a, you know, because the control room can be floating as well. So if you wanted to just uh, access your control room directly from the studio menu, you could just, uh, you know, so if you wanted to always bring that to the front, you know, so some people will just uh, keep their control room there and then when they go to your studio to control room, so this way it's kind of a floating window that's not docked anywhere. But now we could just say control room and you could just bring that right to the front if you have it positioned there. So see if you just want to set up a keyboard shortcut just to open up the control room. Uh, and I know some people who will take their kind of existing project and they will just kind of truncate it over and have uh, the control room set here and their project and maybe they have this control set for meters. Um, so they can have kind of two different control room views. So let me know if that will work for you, Andy. Okay, so we see uh, from Michael Teams, uh, howdy Greg, how about telling me out, uh, bailing me out on changing time signatures in the middle of the songs, I'm lost. Okay, so let's uh, just navigate to a project here. So if we wanted to change uh, time signatures, all you have to do is we could go to a signature track. So we could just right click and we want to add a signature track. So, and we could just I'll just come right here, we'll add track and we'll see signature. So right now it'll be set, it'll default to four, four. And then all you have to do is just click with the pencil tool and then you can say, okay, I want this to be two, four followed by seven, eight followed by five, eight. So you just type in five slash eight, and then if you just kind of click, it'll default to four, four. If you just hit enter and you can go back to common time. 
So try just uh, utilizing a signature track, Michael, and see if that works for you. I think it's pretty straightforward. Thanks for the easy question. All right. Okay, um, so we see, uh, hi, I was wondering if there was a way to have a plugin window close when I open another. I always forget to close a plugin window and open another. I have to close so many windows at the end. So I think that there is a preference. So once we go to preferences here, uh, and it's maybe under VST, let's take a look, uh, maybe under plugins, that the plugins will open in always on top. So probably if you just... Uh, you know, if you wanted to, to, you know, to do that, you could, if you uncheck that, when you open another plugin, that plugin won't stay open and won't stay on top. Uh, and another method you could use is when you go to the windows menu, there is a close all plugin windows. So if you, you feel like you have so many plugin windows that are accumulated, just come to your Windows menu and choose close all plugin windows, and then they will automatically just kind of be shut down for you. All right, I'm going to go ahead in the chat, and I'm going to paste the uh, Zoom meetup. It's going to start in about an hour. So we'll get to as many questions as we can. All right. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, Greg, do you change the buffer size? One for recording, other for mixing. I got an i7-8700. It's been asking 1024 last days for heavy projects. Thanks. Sorry if my question is duplicated. So no problem asking same questions over and over again, but and it hasn't been duplicated. Uh, but it is pretty common for some people to, if you're working with large projects, to you know raise the buffer. So some people will lower the buffer during tracking or put it into like a direct monitoring mode. And some people, when they get to mixing, will then kind of raise the buffer up. So that's not, especially for heavy projects. So that, that's pretty typical. Um, so, you know, a lot of the projects I do, I'm not doing like, you know, 300 tracks or anything in my personal projects. So I don't really have to uh, switch buffers. I don't, I tend not to do it so much, but it is pretty common workflow to do. All right. So Mark Raven is saying, Hey, Cubasters, if you can mouse over that thumbs up and click it one time, so it'll bring joy to Greg and you'll be automatically blessed with tremendous inspiration to create great music. That sounds like it's worth it. Thanks, Mark. All right, so we see uh, Chris Hallam just asking, uh, what's the protocol for getting MIDI data sent out from individual tracks in Cubase to a third-party piece of software? Um, so they're really, you know, some sometimes, you know, people in older, in previous years would use something like Rewire to get it out. If you could let, let me know, Chris, what third-party piece, third party piece of software. So generally, you know, Cubase will send out... Um, will send MIDI out to its destination to, you know, to either a hardware instrument or to a software instrument. Um, but it's not really set up to, uh, most people tend not to set it up to, you know, I want to use a different, uh, program. You know, obviously there's programs that will allow you to do it, to send MIDI data over like ethernet. <clears throat> so if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, something like, uh, VE Pro, you know, you could just simply send a MIDI out destination. Some people use a MIDI loopback device to send MIDI out from Cubase. Uh, but, you know, if you could let us know what program it is, but a lot of programs aren't necessarily capable of seeing that MIDI input from, uh, from Cubase. But, you know, you could try like maybe a, a loopback type of solution. All right, and we see Nick on the live stream. All right, thanks for joining us. Hope to see you on the Zoom meetup.
All right, so it says, uh, I just see from uh, Growbit, uh, emergency, my Cubase 11 hates ASIO and glitches out with nothing on a grid. My CPU has had six cores with 12 threads as well as 32 gigs of 3200 uh, hertz RAM. Um, all right, so... Um, so, I mean, usually, so when you say hates ASIO, um, just, so, I mean, generally that's obviously kind of not the normal state of things. Uh, but I was curious if you could indicate like which video card and if you're running kind of a gaming mode for your video card, if you see, you know, if you're on, uh, do, do, do. So I, I assume you're on PC, but if, you know, but so you could check out some, maybe something like DPC latency mon, uh, and that may be able to indicate, you know, what, uh, what aspects are, uh, that could be, you know, if there's hardware drivers like a network or Wi-Fi or some, something that's creating a lot of interrupts to your, uh, to your, uh, audio stream. It could be something like that, but generally that's, you know, obviously not the case. And I'm sorry that you're running into that. And uh, one other thing to check with the uh, ASIO and glitches is, you know, check to make sure that uh, if you go to the studio setup, um, you know, go over here to the audio system and you may see, uh, you know, make sure that you have ASIO guard active. See if you activate multi-processing. And then you'll also see on a Windows platform, a use Steinberg power scheme. And so make sure that you're using the Steinberg power scheme as well. All right, so we have Samson Strike checking in from Austria. <clears throat> All right, so I just see from John Koskin says, uh, I need device. My Creation Station PC will not uh, boot Windows 10 or even show the OS drive. Any suggestions? Um, so, um, so I, I'm not sure if you checked with Sweetwater because it's generally kind of a, I think there are Sweetwater created PCs. Um, so I'm not sure if they've been helpful for you or maybe if your hard drive is not working, but maybe some other people, I think, you know, obviously Jazz Dude's really good um, with kind of setting these things up. So maybe he has some ideas as well. Okay, so we're just seeing um, uh, about the computer not working well, saying ASIO for all doesn't work, Focusrite, ad, Focusrite ASIO doesn't work, but FL ASIO does, but that's the one that glitches. So that would lead me to think, I mean, it should definitely, um, so I, I'm not that familiar with, with FL, I guess it's Fruity Loops ASIO. Um, but I think that you know, if the focus right ASIO isn't working, that that would be indicative of the audio interface.
Okay, so you see uh, Cubase 12 still crashing the video player. Please fix it. So, you know, let me know what video that you're putting into it. There's obviously a myriad and tens of thousands of different codecs that are available. But yeah, I haven't had any problem. I just did a bunch of video stuff uh, over the weekend. Didn't have any problems in Cubase 12. But, you know, if you go to the Steinberg website, you could um, just, there's a, a really helpful article on which codecs and, contain, and containers that will work with Cubase and what it's designed to work with. So I just did video support uh, in Nuendo Cubase, WaveLab Dorco. So as soon as you come over here, make sure that you have the particular, you know, so these are the supported video formats. And then you could see the different, uh, you know, containers. And, you know, so we could just see, you know, your different video options uh, directly here. So which codec, which container for MP4, AVI, or .move file. So, you know, there could be, you know, and just because a, it says .mp4 or .mov for the file, that could be 10,000 codec combinations of each of those files. So those are just kind of, you know, your, your codecs and your containers. So there's, so, you know, if you could just check to make sure that it's the video file and you could use maybe a utility, something like Handbrake to convert it to one of those as well. Just read through comments, and we see Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. And we have uh, Alan checking in from Scotland. Thanks for joining us. All right, we see Gareth on the live stream. Thanks for being able to make it. All right. Three fourths of hot mess here. We'll see if Pablo can make it, but he's probably busy working on rehearsals. Okay, um, so we see, hi, I've been trying to import a Groove Agent SE kit with custom samples between PC and Mac, uh, saved export file on PC is a .vst preset. When I open the import option on Mac, it won't allow me to open the file. So when I've done this, um, so let's say if we have a Groove Agent SE here, and let's say if I've made custom samples on it, let me just, So let's say I'll just All right, let's say this is my awesome kit that I've just made. Okay, so I'm not sure if you saved it as a preset, but try to select the agent uh, and then just export kit with samples. 
um, and see because that usually works for me. So give that try. So I'm not sure if you're doing that, Ed. But once you have the samples in, instead of saving it as a VST preset, just try to right-click and export the kit with samples. Uh, and then you could export it directly to like a flash drive and move that back and forth. Okay, um, we see question. Uh, is there any any key command that plays or moves the cursor to the beginning of the project measure one without having to rely on the marker track? So if you have the numeric keypad, so let's say if I'm here, uh, you know, and I have like a zero that's kind of large and I could use that for start and stop and I could use the enter key for play. But if I hit the period key on a numeric keypad, that will take you to the beginning of the project. So just the period key on a numeric keypad. So, it, and if you don't play around with a numeric keypad for keyboard shortcuts, there's you know, like, that's where I kind of do my transport on my right hand. So at that point, I just hit the period key and that will take you to the beginning of the project. So on just on the numeric keypad again, and that will take you straight to the beginning of the project without having to utilize a marker track. Okay, so um, so we see a question. I noticed that uh, when I use the pro warping algorithms that if I want to change one part of it, it kicks me out of that algorithm and is now back to custom warp. Uh, is there a way to just change what, uh, what pro has done? So let's say if I'm selecting warping algorithms here. So let's say if I'm using my Elastic Pro, so let's say we're doing kind of free warping. So I'm not sure if this is when you're doing the pro warping. So as I move, it seems like it's still staying in the same algorithm. So, but if maybe if the track is set to very audio, because very audio can use uh, like the standard solo algorithm, and that's what it uses for detection. So maybe if it's with all tracks or just tracks that maybe you've done very audio editing on. So if you could let me know that. All right, wonderful to see Cedric on the live stream. Glad you can make it. And Cedric's joining us from India. All right, so we see from Shane, hey, uh, hey Greg and all Cubase fans, Oscar winning performance from all, big hello from the UK. So thanks for joining us. All right. Okay, so I just see, uh, hey Greg, here in Madrid, question, why can't I MIDI learn from FabFilter uh, plugins? Thanks, you know, so it's really, it could be up to the plugin manufacturer if they allow MIDI learning. So, you know, the vast majority of plugins will allow you to, you know, if I come and have uh, my insert here, so let's say, okay, I just wanted to go to uh, like a VST bass amp, uh, at this point, I could right click and we could learn, um, you know, our various parameter controls. If the plugin doesn't do that, it's a limitation of the plugin's design. So I would reach out to the plugin developer and make sure that they, you know, are aware that, you know, that you'd want to do MIDI learning from it.
Okay, so we see, uh, what is the best way to save a full orchestral template with two small audio files in the media pool? I've disabled all plugins to save RAM and only activate what I need to use. So really at that point, if you wanted to only have like two audio files, um, so let's say if I wanted to start off with, um, let's say I'll jump over to quick Schubert piece here. And let's say I was using this as a orchestral uh, starting off point as a template. So So what I want to do is to, uh, I'll just select all of the events here and delete. So let's say, okay, this is my orchestral template. And we could often, we could also have, you know, within a template. So all we would do at this point is choose to save as template. Um, so if I come here, we could just call this template. March 29th. So when I go to do a new project and if my template had audio files in it, uh, at that point, those audio files could be saved with the template. A lot of times people may not want to say, you know, people often accidentally save audio files in their template and it's like, yeah, every time I start my template, I have to erase all my files. Why is that? You know, because the template is looking at everything that's in the project. But if you want those particular audio files, you could do that. Now to access that template, we would go to new project and you'd see under more, and then we could just kind of come here and say template March 29th. And that's how you could kind of start your project off. All right, so just seeing, um, all right. So we see, uh, just uh, going back to our question from earlier, um, seeing Ray just mentioning, Ray Taylor just mentioning that we could clear all tracks using shift plus alt of plugins. So let's go ahead and take a look. Thanks for the tip. We'll go give it a shot here. So I'll just create empty. So I'll just put some plugins in here. Okay, so let's say these are all selected tracks. I'm gonna hold down alter option and shift. And let's see if we could So let me just see if we do it from here. It says you can clear all selected tracks using uh, shift plus alt option. So let me just try again, see if I get that. So we could just choose no effect with Alt plus uh, on a selected track. So you can give that a try as well. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, so we see uh, 
feature request uh, question. Uh, the new feature to recognize chords from any audio track is great. Uh, would be awesome to enter new chords in the display chord track and the audio part will transpose to the new entered chord. So obviously I think, you know, this is probably step one. I think we'll see stuff maybe heading that direction, but this is a, a great workaround. It's, you know, there's obviously a lot of people want to do that and, you know, there's some tools that do it, but you know, most of them haven't been terribly successful. So. All right, so we have uh, Kolja checking in from Belgium. Thanks for joining us. And John checking in from uh, Talbot in South Wales. Chat just jumped. All right, so I see a um, uh, question. Is there a way to invert the colors and drop down menu from black text over white to white text over black? Uh, is that only a Mac thing? Um, so I don't know of a setting in Cubase to do that. Um, so I, I can't recall if it's uh, different on Windows, but I don't think that there's a Cubase setting for that. Um, that might be an operating system. Uh, issue thing, but I don't know of a setting in Cubase that would invert the colors of drop down menus. Uh, so I just see, what is the best audio mix down question? What is the best audio mix down format for YouTube videos? I use high quality MP3 at the moment, but can, uh, can you get on higher quality or is that not possible when uploading to YouTube? So I would do kind of the high, you know, I, I do obviously a lot of YouTube videos and I just kind of, when I upload a video, I usually have like a 16 bit or 24 bit 48 K audio file in the video. And then, you know, I upload it to YouTube and, you know, whatever it plays back at. So I would, instead of, you know, converting it to, I would give it as high a resolution as possible so it has more information to work with. Uh, but maybe some other people could share uh, insights, but I wouldn't necessarily mix down specifically for uh, YouTube. But I think you could just upload files and YouTube will kind of do its encoding as well. But maybe other people could share. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, now that we can assign quick controls to any plugin in Cubase 12, is there a minute maximum number or can I assign 12 controls to control EQ in CC 121 style? I'm still on Nuendo 11. So quick controls are kind of capped at eight quick controls because, you know, 99% of, you know, controller keyboards have eight encoders. Uh, so it's going to be kind of capped at eight quick controls, but sometimes people will go through different controllers. Um, and so let's say if we go to the MIDI remote here, you know, you may say, okay, I want, uh, like my choice OS controller to control quick controls. And I want these, uh, when we go to, uh, our, our focus status, you know, I could have this on plugins. I could have another eight quick controls that are always fixed to the selected track. So you could have multiple controllers that are 
kind of doing, you know, eight quick controls for the active plugins. Uh, you know, you have one set that does, you know, between the tracks and or the plugins, whatever is active. Or if you want one to be fixed to a specific track, you could have eight knobs as quick controls fixed to that. So you could just kind of adjust the focus uh, value for each of these. So if I would just wanted to come here, you could say, okay, when we go to our focus, um, you know, we could just say, okay, I, I want this to only focus on uh, plugins, but I wanted a different quick control to focus only on tracks. So you could have eight quick controls, but they could kind of be mapped to different types of tasks. Or you could say, I want this to only be track focus, and I only want it to be on audio four, so that no matter what, these eight knobs are going to control the quick controls on channel four and no other channel. So while it's eight quick controls, I could come over here and I go to quick controls on this channel and it's not going to control, but it's, these are going to be dedicated to a particular track. So it's eight per device, but each device could be used for different aspects if you want it to. All right, I'm going to post the uh, the Zoom meetup one more time. I'm going to paste that in the chat field. And I know we had some questions that uh, we will try to get to here that were mailed in. All right, so I just see a quick question on... Um, all right, so we see Chris Howe just saying, uh, hi, Greg, uh, per my question, is wondering about sending MIDI to Max slash MSP. So a lot of times when it's going to be like a software device, make sure that, you know, often I'm not that familiar with Max, uh, but, you know, it could be just that you would, you know, as soon as the software is enabled, that it would just show up as a virtual MIDI port. So, you know, try to see if, you know, so that's how you'd often communicate out just via MIDI internally. So you could try that, Chris. All right. So we see uh, how, quick question, how to delete audio, how to delete overlaps while audio recording. All right. So let's say if I have uh, a recording here. Just get a couple of these questions. All right, now let's say I wanted to do a delete overlap. So if, let's say if I do, uh, so if we go to audio and I think we go to advanced, you could activate delete overlaps. So now as we punch in, it'll just, uh, but I think, so you could try that. Um, but let's try also if we go to preferences to editing and then let's just enable delete overlaps here. So let's see if we do tracking and I punch in. So you could try to just, um, and I think if you just wanted to, you know, if you have that section there, you could remove overlaps just by clicking in the center area. So let's say I do a punch in, I wanna remove the overlaps go to the lower right hand corner and then you could just, or the lower center, and then you could remove the overlaps directly there. And there may be also different uh, audio record modes to, um, let's see if there's one that will do that. Yeah, so just try going into the bottom center and click there. Okay, so we see um, so question, uh, how to utilize the quick controls of VSTI third party? So when I change to another VSTI, the quick control stays consistent. So uh, what we could do with plugins now, whether it's like a virtual instrument or not, with uh, version 12, when I come over here, let's say I'll just, since we're on kind of quick controls, you know, so you may have to kind of manually set up uh, the plugins. So, you know, generally it will be 
whatever the first eight parameters that the instrument does, defines as the highest priority. But if you click on quick controls now for every plugin, you could just click here and then you could set which the default quick controls are if you wanted to override those. All right, so let me get to some of our questions that were mailed in. So we get to those. So I get my mouse to cooperate. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I'm building a new computer next week. Do I need to deauthorize my Steinberg products on the old computer before installing them on the new computer? So if you have Cubase 12 or Dorco 4, you would need to deactivate it. But uh, most of the programs, if you have, if they're USB e-licensor based, all you'd have to do is to take the e-licensor from one computer and that contains the authorizations and the licenses and move it to your other computer. And that's really all you'd have to do. Okay, so we had a question uh, from Soren. Um, so in Wavelab Montage, I want to solo listen to mid inside. I found a free plugin from Voxengo, helps me with that, but I wonder if it's possible in some way with the standard plugins coming with Wavelab to solo side channel in a simple way. So let's take a quick look. Okay, so I know a lot of times what, uh, there's probably a way to do this that may be even more elegant, but let's say if I'm here, um, and let's say I just wanted to go to edit source. You know, one of the things that I often do is, you know, where we see the left and right here on a particular track. So let's say, So let's say I have this, um, but if you click here on the left and right, you could also switch to mid and side. So we could kind of see. So if you wanted to actually edit kind of the mid and side here, um, but so we could switch between the left and right and mid side. And let me see if I could. So I think that we could, so that's kind of one way of doing it. But I think that there might be, and I know that for each of the plugins, as we add plugins, we could uh, have these on specific on specific areas here um, that we could monitor these plugins on the in uh, just on the very specific sides. Uh, like we could have this on the stereo input. We go to channel processing that we could do it directly there. So there's probably a way of doing this. I should have looked it up beforehand, uh, but. So while we do this, so let's say if we're here in the montage, I'll just jump back to the montage. So let's say I am just listening. And I just wanted to now listen to left channel only or mid channel or the sides. 
So just click directly here. So we could mix it to mono or left channel only. So say just in the middle part of the panning spectrum or just in the sides. So you just do it right there in the playback. So we say, so just right there in the playback and then you could just monitor and left and right or mid side without having to uh, worry about getting another third party plugin for that. All right, um, so we had a question about uh, with Very Audio, why the colors change when utilizing the uh, actual uh, scale and chord color scheme. So let's say if I was over here, we may see um, different colors based on the chords. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so let's say we go to our lead vocal and we're in very audio. And we switch our color scheme to scale and chord. So some people uh, were, and the question was, why do we not see kind of the green notes, uh, like these bright green notes? So if we use the editor scale, so here we've just defined our, our editor as being in A major but we don't have chords defined. If we wanted to, like in this project, we have a chord track and a chord track has determined a key to be A major. So since we don't have chords defined, when we see the bright green notes like this color, that indicates that they fall within the chord. And since we just are dealing with the key only and not the chord when we're in the editor scale here in the scale assistant, that's why the, it looks different because within the editor scale, it's just using the scale and it's not referencing any chords until you choose to use the chord track. And then this color green will indicate that it's being, uh, that it fits within the particular chord. All right, so I see a question. Uh, in the key editor, I, if I try to lengthen a note, it won't allow me to change the size of the note freely. It jumps to a dotted hole unless I turn off the snap function. If I try to quantize the ends, it jumps to a dotted hole note. Why? The quantize setting is set to 16th notes. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can recreate this. I'll just quickly add an instrument track. All right, and I'll just put this into quick step entry mode. And let's put this for quarter notes. All right, so we have some notes and I'll put some space in. Just hitting my left and right arrow keys. All right, so we have some notes in. Um, so it just says when uh, I try to uh, change the size of a note freely. So I'm just gonna turn my snap off here. So we'll just hit the letter, just turn off my step entry mode. Then I'm gonna hit the letter J to turn snap on and off. So let's say if I just wanted this. So if we zoom in, I can freely kind of resize at will. So if I want to take these notes and make them shorter, 
make all these notes longer. So it's not kind of jumping to uh, particular grids as I do this. And let's say if I have this set to 16th notes, it's not adjusting. So even with these adjusted, I could freely adjust. Um, so let's say if I turn on my snap, let's say for these notes here, and it's not automatically adjusting the length. Um, so, you know, it seems like you're, you know, it says won't allow you to change the size of the note freely, jumps to a dotted whole note unless I turn off the snap function. Um, if I try to quantize the ends, it jumps to a dotted whole note. Why? The quantize setting is set to 16th. Um, so I'm not sure what is causing that. I mean, see if I'm doing anything differently than what you are. But if I just wanted to come here, uh, you know, see if, you know, if your quantize is set here, check to see, you know, what your grid is set to. So maybe your grid is like, um, you know, see if you have, you know, so if we just come directly here, we should see, you know, make sure that it says grid here uh, and not events or grid plus events, that it just says grid. Um, but everything is kind of working as, as expected here without jumping the lengths to, uh, you know, to dotted whole notes. So let's say if I switch my grid mode here, if that changes anything, but it seems to be working. Let me know if I'm doing something differently than what you are. So, um, all right, we'll move on. All right, so we have a question. Uh, Hi, Greg. I always have problems with Windows and Cubase and plugin scalings. My monitor is an LG Ultra Wide 2560 times 1080 resolution. I set the resolution to uh, 2560 by 1080 recommended. I set Windows scaling to 125%. I set application scaling and Cubase preference to minus 125%. Enable high DPI. Now, when I open some plugins, such as native MD4 HD Sooth 2 plugins, the plugin window it has the wrong scaling, so the, the solution is to close everything and set Windows to 100% and run Cubase again. How to fix this? So it could be that maybe those plugins aren't high DPI compatible yet. Um, so, you know, we could try to do a lot to make, you know, plugins conform to work with, you know, high DPI standards, but... Um, it could be just that those particular, you know, check to see if you have high DPI versions available uh, of those particular, if they're uh, set to run in uh, high DPI as well. All right, so a question. Uh, when I drop a MIDI file from Stylus RMX into a session, the tempo track always follows the original tempo of the MIDI file and destroys the project tempo. How to fix this? So probably what you need to do is go to your preferences. And uh, it could be just a preference when we go to uh, MIDI files and try to uh, come over here and you'll see ignore master track events on merge. So as you drop a file in, this should ignore any tempo changes. So try unchecking this preference. So once again, go to preferences, to editing, to MIDI, to MIDI file, and try unchecking ignore master track events on merge. Okay, so um, we see um, question, uh, how do you change the chord voicing and chord track? Cubase is not allowing me to change the voicing and the info line. So let's go ahead and take a look. All 
me just find a project I was thinking of. All right, so let's say if I have uh, like a Rhodes patch here and let's say a chord track and I want the Rhodes to... All right, so if I come right here, so let's say I click on this and I just want to select from the voicing here, that seems to... All right, now when you do this, you may want to go to the setup voicings and just make sure that you're not, um, you know, so when you still have the chord track selected here, make sure that you're not, if you go to the setup chord voicings, that maybe it's just not being limited to triads there. Uh, but that seems to be able to do different, um, the voicings so let's say if i wanted to also come over here to guitar voicings versus so i could say okay let's do guitar voicings and i want this to be so if i say okay let's make this an e and if i switch this to piano voicings here now So like when I'm in guitar, you'll notice that when we play an E chord, that it will be lower than an E flat. So, you know, because that's gonna be the lowest string for the guitar open. So when you play E flat, so try just switching to voicing and the voicing's characteristics directly here uh, from the chord track itself and see if that helps. Uh, so we have a question, uh, Greg. Uh, many VST instruments have the ability to trigger a chord just pressing one note or have arpeggiators. How can I consolidate those MIDI notes in a track and be able to manipulate them in the MIDI editor? So it could really depend on the instrument itself. So many instruments kind of just generate it internally and don't export that out. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why is they probably spend a lot of money doing these arpeggiators and they don't want everyone to be able to kind of take all of the arpeggiators and be able to kind of backward engineer it. But if we wanted to go to even like Halion Sonic or Halion, we have like a flex razor. We can show you how to do it here. So a lot of instruments don't offer this capability. So, but let's say if I wanted to come over here to um, like a guitar, And let's say, I just wanted this to be, um, so if you wanted to just kind of come here and, um, so what this is doing is in essence, it's triggering kind of, uh, when we go into edit, and let's say, if, uh, I think we go into, you know, we'll have different arpeggiators here. So within like how in Sonic SE, I could just say, okay, I want to enable record. And now once that recording is done, I could drag this particular MIDI event right into my project window. So. So not all, the vast majority of instruments don't allow you to have that uh, handled, but that's an example of one it does. So it's really the design of the particular instruments. 
All right, so we had a question. Uh, in audio connections, when I create a group, I should be able to choose no bus for the audio output in, in the ad track dialog, but that option is not available. Once the group has been created, I can, of course, ch uh, choose no bus in the inspector. Would you ask the developers to fix that omission? So I'll, I'll pass it on. It's probably not going to be the highest priority. Uh, I think the vast majority of people will have an output set to the bus and it could cause a lot more confusion not having a bus set for a, you know, not having a bus set when adding a group. So, but uh, I'll definitely kind of pass it on. So um, what you could do is, you know, if you want it to be set to no bus, let's say we're going to your VST connections, we could have... Uh, we'll add, let's say, a stereo bus, and we'll call it to nowhere. And now at this point, when I go to add a group channel, um, so let's say if I come here, let's add a group channel. And then at that point, we could just route it to nowhere and then have your group channel route it not to a bus so um so you could try that but it's probably not the highest priority but i'll again make sure to pass it along All right, so we have a question uh, about the cord pads. Uh, it says, I have some inversions in the cord pads, but when I drag them onto the cord track, they change to the root positions. I tried with adaptive voicing on and off, same results, any ideas? So let's go ahead and take a look. So we'll go here to the cord pads. So let's say, um, turn this on and, all right, so let's say, Okay, so I will now define this chord. So let's say I'll do a D minor with an A in the bass. And let me, so it will come over here. Let's drag it out. So, now, if I want it to play, let's say a D minor, I'll just put a D minor chord here and I will. And let's go ahead and just monitor through the roads. So it looks like the inversion carried over. Um, so when we listen to it here, so let's go ahead and just check. Let's say if I drag these down to my roads part, the two chords. And we'll edit them. We'll see if they carried over. So it looks like it dragged the same chords over, but it played it back. So um, so I see when we dragged it down, it appeared to be that the inversion didn't take, but it seems like when we listen to it, that the inversion audibly is there. So let me know if you have, if that's the case for you as well, but it sounds like the inversion is part of it. All right. And go back to our live questions. Thanks for all the questions sent in. Again, if you want a uh, question sent in advance, you could go to clubcubase at steinberg.de and you could always send questions in advance. And we got uh, just about ready to go. I'm going to paste the Zoom uh, meetup and we're going to start our Zoom session. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that again. And I will go ahead and start the Zoom and again, it's a great way to meet people who are on the live streams. Uh, so I'll just leave this open here and uh, we'll transition over to the Zoom meetup. So I'll go ahead and start the meeting.
All right, so go ahead and start the meeting here. All right, we have some people migrating on. All right, so we see Marcos and Luca. All right, we have Jan, all right. All right. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Great to see everyone. We see Benny is joining. All right, so I'll keep the, the live stream going just for another couple minutes. Hey, okay. all right, and we have David M. Hey. Hello. Hi guys. All right. And John Costigan's coming in. Hi everybody. Hey David, good to see you. Yeah. All right, and we'll let the meeting go for another minute or so. Also, just uh, really quick on the meeting. Um, I know we usually have Michael Marshall from Somerset, UK. So there was someone else who reached out to me who watches the live streams who's also in Somerset. Uh, and they were wondering if they could get in touch with you. So if Michael Marshall is watching this, if you want to email me to clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to kind of put you two in touch if you're neighbors or live around the corner from each other or something like that. All right, so we have some more people in the waiting room. All right, so we have Kolja and Gerald. So we have Soren. All right, some more people coming in. All right, let's see if there's more people migrating over. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the live stream. So uh, once again, I'll just uh, I'll leave just real quick. I'll just put the, see if I could put the invitation, uh, the Zoom meeting details on the screen. So let's see if I could do that. So people, if they want to get over quickly, they could do that. So let me see if I could switch my window here. So if we want to look at the meeting invitation again here, so the meeting IDs, Sorry, let me just get some more people in. All right, and Mark Rabin, Michael Pierce. All right, so I'll just get this up on my screen just for a minute so people could see if they're still on the live stream. So we could see the, the Zoom meetup details here. So we see the meeting ID 845-4650-5216 and passcode 735-812. And again, this is live on uh, March 29th, 2022. So if you're watching this like three years from now, it, it's already occurred, so. All right, so with that, I'll go ahead and end the live stream and then we'll hopefully see uh, more people joining the Zoom. So look forward to seeing everyone over on the Zoom. Bear with me, I'm just gonna jump over to the meeting and end the live stream. All right, and the live stream is over. How's everyone doing? <laughs>